Good morning, Cody. It's you and me this morning. Good to have you here. Today, we're going to talk, for a little while at least, about health and getting help. Did you ever ask for help? Did you ever not want to ask for help? Sometimes. People ever laugh at you if you ask for help? Good. I'm glad. People used to laugh at me. I'll give you a story. I'll tell you this. I was a young kid once, and I was younger than you. And I remember we were walking through the forest. This was winter. I think we were looking for a Christmas tree. It was up in Alaska. A lot of snow. And I was a little peanut, probably six, seven years old, walking through the snow, trying to follow my dad's footsteps. And it was deep. And I'd always get stuck. And I'd ask for help. And my brothers would sometimes laugh at me because I was getting stuck all the time. Dad would pick me up, pull me out of the snow, put me all back down, kind of like a turtle laying on his back. He couldn't get up. He would pull me up and finally, because I kept getting stuck, put me up on his shoulders. And that was awesome. I got a lot of laughter over that. Though. I remember my brothers calling me things like lazy, calling me whim. Kind of sad, isn't it? But you know what? I didn't care. If I was on his shoulders, they were in the dirt, or in the snow. I was the best seat in the house. Now, I'm telling you this story for a reason. A lot of times that we need help. We need help and we don't know what to do. And sometimes it may come when you feel like you shouldn't ask. You should be able to do this yourself. But we should never be afraid to ask God for help. Because he's always there. He's always there to help us. And there's a lot of things that we can't do by ourselves. And it's good to recognize that. One thing in particular that we would never be able to do by ourselves is get to heaven. Be good enough to get to heaven, right? But what did he do? Yeah, he died on the cross. He took away our sins. And he says that right now he holds on to us. He carries us. One day he's going to carry us into heaven. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Until that day, he's going to continue to carry us, continue to help us. And there will be people who laugh. Jesus, in our, in our sermon text today, talks about how there will be some people who laugh at us for because we need God. But uh, I'm not laughing. Are you laughing? What an awesome thing to be sitting on God's shoulders. It's the best seat in the house, don't you think? Knowing that he's going to carry you through life. Knowing that he's going to carry you into heaven. He's going to help us with all these things. It's something Jesus wants us to know today. We're going to talk more about this in a section called the Beatitudes. It's kind of a big word. For all of the blessings that we have. Even though it might seem like we're weak, it might seem like we can't do these things by ourselves, maybe we can't, God's there doing them for us. That's what makes our lives so special. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Kind of a deep topic, but it's a good topic. So why don't we fold our hands and ask God to help us. Dear Jesus, we thank you for loving us so much that you're always there to help. Help us to recognize that we need it so that we take it and so that you can help us. Thank you for that promise that you're going to carry us into heaven itself. And we ask that you help us to never be ashamed of that, to never apologize for that, but to hold that proudly. And to share that with the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you for coming up. <coughs> we will continue by seeing verses 3 to 4 of our hymn.
at what is likely the most popular part of uh, the most powerful sermon ever spoken. No small thing. We're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount and that one particular part of that sermon called the Beatitudes, or the Blessed Deeds, where Jesus talks about the blessings that are ours because of who he has made us to be. Talking about human characteristics, or I'm, I, excuse me, Christian characteristics. Now recognize he's not here speaking just to the world. This is one of these unique instances where he's speaking only to us, only to Christians, talking to us about who he has made us to be and why those characteristics that he has inspired within us are blessings. Because not everybody sees it that way. Sometimes maybe even we have a hard time seeing it that way, that these things are blessings. I'll give an example, or a contrast rather. Today's Super Bowl Sunday, probably couldn't go without at least mentioning that. Uh, who's winning today? If you want to somebody will tell me Packers. They just can't let it go, right? <laughs> Obviously, they're not going to win today. If they get done, who is going to win? You might all have your guesses. Basically, it's going to be, I think it's safe to say, the strongest, the fastest, and the most well-prepared, confident team. You have those things. You have strength. You have speed. You have confidence. Yeah, they're probably going to do very well. Those are the characteristics that get it done, that win characteristics that we admire, which is also why we're going to have a number of men playing a game today that will earn them more money than you and I will probably ever see in our lifetime, because those are the characteristics that this world celebrates, but they're not the characteristics that Jesus celebrates in us. Characteristics are quite different, characteristics that are much more valuable. So to put it very simply, weakness, slowness, Neediness, characteristics that very often aren't championed among us. No one is proud of being weak or slow or needy. In fact, these are things we often don't want to be. But Jesus shows us why it's a good thing. He's not saying if you can go do these things, you're going to get blessings. No, he says these are who you are, and don't be ashamed of that. These are characteristics that you have, and don't ever feel like you need to apologize for that, because these characteristics allow you to see something the rest of the world can. The power and the strength and the givingness of our God. Read this section to you again, where Jesus says this so beautifully, so simply, Matthew chapter 5. And when he saw the crowds, he went up onto a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. And he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are born, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is God's word. Now, as with many things, this is a section that we could spend days talking about. We don't have days, we have minutes. And so I'm going to just summarize these things for you in three very short terms. Summarize these Beatitudes in three ways. God says we are blessed because we are weak, we are blessed because we are slow, and we are blessed because we are needy. I'm going to take those first three that, that I see under the weakness. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are the meek. And the operative act question is why? Why would these be blessings? Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who meek, or who, who are meek, because they are able to see things that the rest of the world in their arrogance cannot. <coughs> An example. Jesus was in the temple at one point, and he saw two men. And one was praying to God. One was praying to God that 
He was very proud of who he was. Thank you, God, for making me as I am. Thank you, God, for giving me the skills that I have. Thank you, God, for making me better than most. In fact, better than this man over here. A man who was not poor in spirit, a man who was rich in spirit, a man who saw all of the good things that God had given him that he was. But then there was another man off in the corner, not even wanting to lift his face to heaven for the shame of what other people would see, for the belief that he did not deserve any of God's blessings, but he prayed too. Lord, forgive me. I am unworthy of your blessings, but forgive me. And Jesus asked the crowd, which one went home forgiven? It was that man who was poor in spirit because he could see that he needed God for God's forgiveness. And that is exactly what God wanted to give him. And he got it. It was the one who was not poor in spirit, who saw that he deserved it, who saw that he was great, that rejected it and denied himself of that forgiveness. Blessed is the one who was poor in spirit because they mourn. When we talk about mourning. You know, one of the things that we often talk about is the mourning over the ones that we love, the ones who have died. And there is a connection here. But what Jesus is speaking about more specifically is mourning over the sins of the world, mourning over our own sins, our own failures. <clears throat> mourning over the way things are compared to the way they should have been. Mourning over who we are. It seems like weakness, doesn't it? But there's somebody else who mourned. Shortest verse of the Bible, people will tell me, Jesus wept. Why? Why would Jesus, the Son of God, who saw all things, weep? He mourned because he saw the effect of sin in the world. He saw how he had a perfect plan way in the beginning, and that plan had failed. Not because of his doing, but because of the free will that he gave to his people. It failed, and now his people were dying, one after another after another. And there was sadness in that. And there should be sadness in that. And when we can see sadness in that, we recognize that things should be better. But he says, blessed are you when you mourn, because you will be comforted. Jesus also said at that very same time when he wept, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies, which is why whoever lives and believes in me will never die. We weep over the problems of the world and the sins within, and yet we are given that comfort that this world does not last. The life that we have, that lasts. That lasts forever. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are we when we recognize that there is nothing within us that is worthy of celebration except for that which God has given to us. And he has given us everything. He who created and owns the world has made us heirs of all that is his. Because of us. Because of him. When we are weak, we are strong. When we are weak, we see these things. And we see what God has given to us. Let's go to slow. I use this word, paraphrasing these next three thoughts. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure. Blessed are the peaceful. Or the peacemakers. Peacemaker. In order to know what it means to make peace, you have to know what it means to make conflict. And I'm pretty safe in, in saying I think we all do that. We all know what it means to make conflict. We all know what it means to either initiate or continue a struggle. And it's one of the easiest things in the world to do. I remember my dear mother, tough, tough lady, very sweet, telling me once in the midst of a conflict, JP, it takes two to tango. I don't know if you know what that means. Um, <coughs> Nice little metaphor there. It takes two to dance. If you want to dance, it's going to take two people. The only way to end that dance is for one person to sit down and stop dancing. It takes two to fight. Very rarely, if ever, is there a one-sided fight where only one is throwing the punches, where only one is saying the words. It takes two. All it takes to stop is for one person to stop swinging. One person to stop speaking. But why is that hard? Because if you stop fighting when you're in the midst of a fight, what's going to happen? 
you're going to lose. You're going to lose. If you're in the middle of a physical fight and you stop fighting, you're going to lose. You're going to get beaten up. If you're in a verbal fight and you stop speaking, your attacker is going to keep coming at you and you're going to lose, right? Maybe. But let's look at it a little bit deeper. I, I mentioned before that it's very unlikely that there's ever a one-sided fight. There is one very popular, very famous occurrence of a one-sided fight, and that's the fight between man and God. God, in our Old Testament lessons, says, what did I do to you? How have I offended you? Making the case that he had not. They had offended him. They had swung at him. They had accused him. And yet, he didn't swing back. His greatest example of this is when he came to this world. And when Jesus was accused, and Jesus was ridiculed, and Jesus was arrested, and beaten, and eventually killed, he never swung back. In fact, as he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them. But they kept doing it. They kept beating him, and they kept crucifying him. Did he lose? Depends how you look. When he did die, and as God had prophesied already in the beginning, Satan did crush him, did, did strike his heel. He did hurt him. And for a while it did seem like he lost. But when he died, right before he died, as he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, we could say very truly that he went back to where he belonged. And when he rose again, he took back that physical life that he once had. He was back to normal, right? No, because when he rose, he didn't just rise by himself, but he was able to bring with him all of his people. So did he lose? Or did we win? And that's the beauty of the fight, that Jesus didn't fight. By allowing these things to happen, he made peace. Peace with us, peace with God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because you will be called children of God. Why? Because we've learned this from our Father. We learn how to make peace from our God. We learn what mercy is, which is why we're able to show mercy. And it's not weakness. <clears throat> weakness is swinging back. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. Weakness is yelling back. Easiest thing in the world to do. Strength? Not. Showing mercy, showing peace. Being pure, because our Father is pure. And that last one. In being pure, having that relationship with God, showing mercy, we, we want to desire Him more and more. We see Him more and more. I'm going to back up. I, you'll notice I skipped verse 6. That was purposeful. I wanted to add that to verse 10 because I see these going together so well. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Not the praise of the world, but the praise of God. Not to see more clearly where I fit in the world, but where I fit with God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You know, taking off of that last one, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now that would be a beautiful thought, to, to, to be filled with that knowledge of God, to see Him face to face. There's a passage of Scripture I want to share with you. It's from John chapter 14, where Jesus is, He's encouraging His disciples, His very scared, very confused disciples on that night when He is about to leave them. He gives them lots of words of comfort. And, and one is this. Uh, Philip says to, Lord, to, to, to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. I want to see God. I want to be filled with God. <coughs> Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? The Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me, doing his work. Jesus making the point to Philip and to them, thus, every time we hear God speak to us, we see a little more of his heart. We see a little more of his face. We see who it is. We hunger and thirst for righteousness, for that assurance from God. God promised.